Good evening, Rabbi Monique from Soul Fridges. Owen Power here. Hello, Owen. Good Owen, to see you. Since since I have you, you can see me. I can. Lovely. And so, hear you. So it's good. So you were also a reminder, even though I already had it in my head as a reminder. Um, <clears throat> before we start to just um, remind people about some good practices while we're doing this to make it easier for people who are either deaf or hard of hearing to um, be able to engage a bit better with what the conversation. So um, first of all, if you have your camera off, anybody who is hard of hearing and maybe needs to lip read won't be able to um, know necessarily what you're saying. So just if everybody could be aware of that. If you can, I know not everybody is comfortable having the camera on, but if at all possible, when you're asking a question or you're you're engaging, you know, part of the discussion, if you could possibly have your camera on, that would be really helpful to people. Um, other things is to make sure that you're positioned in front of the camera. So not like this, so people can see your face. Um, and also if you put your hand, like, I know I'm guilty of this, so I'm going to have to be very careful. I have a tendency to do this sometimes when I'm thinking, um, but my hand then gets in the way of somebody being able to um, register what my lips are saying. So just to be conscious of that, if you're speaking. Um, yeah, and if you, you know that you need to sort of reposition your lamp, just so it's easier Likewise, oh, and did I cover everything on that list? You did. You're absolutely brilliant, and thank you so much. You're very thank welcome. You. You're very welcome. I had a friend I was talking to the other day who does lip read, and I got a real lesson in it because I kept dipping my head, and she said, "I can't see your lips," and it was about five times during the conversation. So um, I will really try hard not to do that here. Um, but please let me know if I'm doing that. And um, so welcome everybody. Now that we've officially started, um, I'm Rabbi Monique Mayer of the Bristol and West Progressive Jewish Congregation. And uh, we're gonna look at not all of chapter five because it is quite lengthy um, through Pirkei Avot, but Pirkei Avot is one of my favorite texts because it deals with the um, improvement of character and how we can be better people very much seen as a Musar text, which many of you know is my thing. Um, I teach a lot of Musar. So um, Musar as in instruction, correction, um, really refining our character traits. So I thought what I'd do is pick different uh, Mishnah, different sections from this chapter that tie in with how we can specifically become better people in different ways, like what lessons we might glean from that. Um, there are a number of lists throughout this entire uh, chapter of Mishnah. Uh, there's lists of 10, there's lists of seven, there's lists of miracles, there's lists of um, what makes somebody wise or not. We're not gonna look at any of that. We're gonna start with one that has to do with temperament, which, uh, which I think is very much in keeping with um, how we can refine ourselves by interacting in a better way with other people. Um, let's say the blessing for study first before we continue. So, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam Asher Kidshanu B'Mitzvotav Sivanu La Asok B'Divrei Torah. We'll go to the next page. So, could I have a Reader, please. Um, in English is fine. I'll yeah. read it. If oh no, go ahead. There are four kinds of temperaments: easy to become angry and easy to be appeased. Their gain disappears in their loss. Hard to become angry and hard to be appeased. Their loss disappears in their gain. Hard to become angry and easy to be appeased. A pious person, a chosid. Easy to become angry and hard to be appeased. A wicked person. 
Thank you. So before we start talking about this, I want to say that the Talmud, uh, the Talmud says that a person is recognizable for three, three things, their pocket, their cup, and their anger. And how we spend, how we drink, and how we show our anger exhibit our true essence. So let's just dive right in and see what is this? Let's just look at the first statement to start with. What is this trying to tell us? What does this even mean about their gain disappears and their loss? I guess their gain is the ease with which they are appeased. Um, and their loss is of their temper. Ah, okay. So that's one way, of, that's one possibility. Okay. I think that was Linda, yeah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Um, any other ways of looking? At, yeah, and that's Norman. I can't see everybody, so apologies. I will try to. Hi. Um, yeah. It, it um, says to me, uh, they, uh, whatever it is they gain from this, they lose much more. How so? They're, they're, well, it says their gain is, disappears in in their loss. So, so uh, um, they, they've been appeased, but uh, um, you know their their anger is greater than their, their appeasement. Easy to become angry. Well, and, and what do they you, gain from that? They gain they 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 lose more than they gain. If you think about somebody who's like that, if everybody kind of imagines someone who they know is like that in their life, right? What do you actually, what impression do you walk away with when you've had that kind of encounter with that person? Ronnie, is that Ronnie who's raising the yeah. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, you, what you're left with is their anger because that's much stronger that it leaves a stronger impression than if they say okay I'm not angry anymore but but the anger le um, lasts a longer time in in the in the mind of the person who was the object of the anger right so so it's not this statement is not simply about what's going on in the head of that person. It's also about the interactions with other people, right? I mean, I, I know sometimes when I've had that kind of interaction, it's exactly what you said, Ronnie, like all I can think about is like, I'm like this after having talked to them and it doesn't, you know, they might have calmed down, but I'm still worked up after the conversation. So, um, whatever gain they have by finally being appeased, yeah, that they they not only lose out because they got angry, but they, they've lost something in, in the relationship with the other person. Any no, other, uh, go ahead. Sorry, uh, I was just going to add, I think the loss is, because if you got really angry with me and calmed down, I would, yes, I would smile at you, et cetera, and then think, oh, I'm going to avoid Rabbi Monique in the future, <laughs> yeah. you know, that, you know, I think it's, I'm not going to waste time with her. I think that's a lot to do with the loss too. It's the walking uh, in eggshells. So it's walking on eggshells. Yeah. You don't want to take that. And, and, um, well, let's see it. Let's see what the second one says. So what about the second one? I wonder if I typed that one correctly. Hard to become angry, hard to be a pe No, I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, that one's correct, that one's correct. Can I uh, make a comment about the second one? Yeah, go ahead, thanks, Jim. Uh, it, it kind of is the opposite of the first one, I suppose. Okay. Uh, the loss, is that they are quite hard to be appeased. Yeah. 
their gain, the gain is, is that they don't get angry very easily, which I suppose is a good thing up to a point. But if then having got angry, it's difficult to calm them down or reason with them, then that's their loss. Yeah. And I, I see that as the opposite of the first one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, that's not the person you're tiptoeing around on eggshells, right? Like that, that actually it takes a while for them to get to that point. Any other comments about the second one? Someone who bears a grudge. Can I? Oh. Yes, yeah, so, so on Andrea, yeah. So, so you said someone who bears a grudge. Could that, could someone who bears a grudge be any of the other ones? Is it is that strictly for the second type? And the last one. Yeah, they carry they carry it around. They carry around that chip. Um, somebody else was trying to say something, and I'm doing it. I'll hold my hands down. Uh, Bernard. Yes. Hello. Um, my feeling is that there is some maybe rigidity, maybe some uh, uh, if you are to, to become angry, but hard also to be appeased means that you are kind of uh, don't want to to open yourself. Don't want to what yourself? To open yourself. Do you think it's a bad uh, ego? You, you, you cannot protect yourself or while uh, in the first one, um, to me, there is a sense of unbalance mm. in the way that um, you can go from one, one extreme to the other. Yeah, they don't seem to be have a lot equanimity, that first person, right? They're at the whim of whatever they're hearing or being subjected to. They, have, they actually don't have any self-control. Yeah. Any other? Any? Um, so I'll open it up. We, we you can comment on any of them. We haven't. So we've gone through the first two, but what about the rest or any other comments? Can I just make another comment about the second one? Sure. Um, with the idea of their loss disappearing. I mean that that sounds like a good thing mm -hmm. if their loss disappears and they like so it, it seems to me to be a that they're suggesting it's a much better thing than being easy to anger and easy to appease. Yeah, it's 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 um I guess maybe it's making the point that it's more important to hold your temper in the first place than it is to easily forgive. Yeah, it's like a step up, right? It's a step closer. Like it's definitely a step up from the first one. Yeah. Oh, we've got three people and I can't. Uh, let's see. Carolyn. I'm wondering whether the second one is someone who um, has thought about it before he becomes angry. Mm. It's uh, and then it's hard to appease because they really are concerned about what it is they're angry about and they want some kind of a change now whether that what that the loss disappears in their gain i'm not sure i can't do anything with that let's see if anybody else has something to um clarify uh pete you got your hand up yeah so i want to carry on from caroline um but put it the other way, when a person is hard to become angry, it presumably gives the person who they're angry at the opportunity to change themselves. Mm. And when you hit that wall of, uh, there's a lovely phrase from where I grew up, which is, um, you know, beware the, beware the anger of a, a patient man or a quiet man. Mm. It's that thing of you've given them the opportunity to change. You've given them the opportunity to change. And 
it's less about the appeasing, it's more about the, you haven't made that change. And perhaps a better word than appease would then become forgiveness. Yeah, it's interesting because the other word that this gets translated as is pacify. To be pacified rather than um, forgiven. But I, it's interesting because if we're thinking about in terms of temperament and trying to remain even keel, the minute all the anger gets directed at the other person, you're no longer on even keel. Like your, your emotion, your, your internal state becomes entirely dependent on the other person. That doesn't necessarily happen with your angry. There are times when you can be angry and you mean, here's the border. Don't cross this line. And you're, you're still in control. Um, in control as in, in terms of what's coming out of your mouth or like, where's the control? Yeah. But what about what's inside? Still. Still feel like you're in control. Yes. Well, there are also examples where you can sound angry in order to make a point. So I think a lot of us have done that with children, right? That you sound really stern and angry um, to make them sit up and take notice, but you're not re like you've you're not really feeling like that internally. So that's one example where that may not be what's going outside. That, well, and, that yeah. won't work if you're not really internally committed to what you're saying. The kids won't listen. They'll, they'll, they'll tune you out. Do you see a difference? Be, what, what difference do you see between being committed and being seething in anger? Because I, I see a difference. You can sound very angry. I mean, you could, you, 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 you know, maybe, maybe we're defining the word differently. That's possible. Yeah, it might just be that we're seeing it from different, yeah, different. John. So I'm, I'm still, I'm sorry if I missed this when I was distracted, but I'm still not sure what's, what they gain and what they lose. I mean, I thought maybe in the second one, their loss was like the loss of something that makes them angry. And then the loss disappears in their gaining of their, their sanity, I suppose, or their rationality again. But then that doesn't explain the first one. I mean, what, what was gained? Maybe, maybe, no, it doesn't. It really doesn't. It, it can't be that. So I don't know if anyone had any idea, but what it is that's gained and lost. So from what we were talking about before, um, with the first one, their gain, the fact that they were easy to be, they could be appeased or they could be pacified, disappears in the loss. What they end up losing is possibly respect, possibly the other person wanting to be around them at all. So that disappears in that loss, that loss of temper, right? They lose a lot of other things. With the second one, um, the loss disappears in their gain. It's interesting because I have to say, I was hoping you all would send a little more insight onto that second one because I did a bunch of reading and I couldn't quite come to grips with the second one. But maybe, is there anybody else who wants to have another go at it or should we keep going? <laughs> Uh, let's see, Norman. Yeah, I, I think that this is referring to uh, aspects of a person's temp temp well, temper, character. Yes. So, so it's about one, th so a positive aspect of a person's character might be outweighed by its negative or a negative right. person, uh, a negative aspect of a person's character might be outweighed by what's positive about their character. I think that's what it's trying to say, that there's this, there's these things that um, outweigh each other. I think we, I think we all have that. I think the confusion is what exactly in the second one is the loss and what is the gain. I think what I'm going to do is move us on because we have a lot of other things to look at that I'd love for us to look at tonight. We might not to get to everything, but I want to give us the opportunity to look at those other things so we can just sit with that. Um, the pious person, we've talked a lot of, already about 
hard to become angry and then easy to be appeased. And then I'm sorry, Andrea, but I'm gonna push onward. Um, I know that there's gonna be lots of comments here, um, but that's the exciting piece, thing about these texts is that we can keep adding to them. And then a wicked person is just easy for them to become angry and there's, it's really, really difficult for them to be appeased. And so that's seen as someone, because in fact, there's nothing about loss or gain in that statement. You know, um, it's basically all loss, but we will go on to the next one. So the next one we've got, I was gonna say one more thing. The rabbis refer to anger as a form of idolatry. I just wanna make a point of that because the one who is angry does not even consider the divine presence important. And part of the reason for that is because, of course, the person who is in front of you, who you may be ang sorry, may be angry with, just like you was made in the divine image. So um, you are uh, devaluing the human being and devaluing the divine. And we will move on. And I just I encourage you to look at your more of your questions later. So this next one's about learning, and. Uh, We've all encountered each of these different kinds of learners. And uh, who would like to read this one? Can I have a volunteer? Yes, I'll do it. Thanks, Jennifer. There are four types of learners. One who grasps quickly and forgets quickly. Their gain is offset by their loss. B, one who grasps slowly and forgets slowly. Their loss is offset by their gain. C, one who grasps quickly and forgets slowly is wise. D, one who grasps slowly and forgets quickly. This is a bad portion. Okay, now before we even jump into this, clearly this isn't commenting on anybody who has definite memory issues. It has nothing to do with the kind of student. So it's really important to kind of clarify that. We're not talking about someone who might have dementia, or um, Alzheimer's or anything with serious uh, memory issues. This is with someone who is, you know, sitting down and trying to learn. So uh, where do we start? Who wants to start? I'd quite like to start. It's, it feels so different to the one about anger because that anger, you sort of feel like you should be able to control it yourself, but whether you can control the speed with which you learn and forget, I don't know, to some extent, maybe you can, but um, yeah, I feel, yes, it feels like you've been categorized. That's it. That's, yeah, it, D is a bad portion. Like you've just been served that, um, that kind of brain. Sorry. Well, and it's interesting you said that because one of the comments about this is that, let me see if I can find it. So chacham, right, is wise. It says that instead of chassid because whereas with the anger, it's about moral development, this is about intellectual development. So it's specifically why a different word is used in this case. It's, it's not a moral comment. It's more about intellectual um, and again, it's coming from a particular time period. Obviously, we have different understandings about learners, but you know, and and how students learn, um, and that we have different learning styles. But let's see what else, what you all come up with as well on this. Who's the, why is the, um, the one who grasps slowly and forgets slowly, their loss is offset by their gain? What's that about? Hmm. Um, can I? Sure. Um, the thing that it's, um, if you learn, uh, if you grasp, sorry, slowly, it means that not that, uh, not necessarily that you have difficulties to, follow that but that you are very attentive to each word or uh, mm -hmm. you, you are you're very open your ears are, and your brain and your 
is is very open to to what is told you and uh, and so maybe that's why you forget slowly because uh, you have recorded the teaching more mm. attentively that you've really concentrated and 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 been attentive Pete you want to add to that yeah, I, I, for me, when I'm reading it, the loss and the gain is the opportunity to actually integrate learning into practice and behavior. Mm. So when you're talking about gain, yes, you can gain a lot of knowledge, but if you don't actually apply it to what you're doing, it's useless. And if you forget it quickly, it really doesn't matter someone who's grasping it slowly and, and, and struggles with it, but actually forgets slowly over time. Presumably there's some gain there because they're actually able to bring it into their life and to apply it. If we're talking about moral instruction or, or religious instruction, then it, it has the time to actually, some of it, become a part of that person's life and their behavior. I like the word that you used be, near the beginning of what your comments was integrate, being able to integrate it into their life. And if it's just bits of knowledge and dropped, then it's never carried forward, is it, into the rest of life? Um, like you said, whether it's moral instruction or anything else, or even a skill that you learn. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm, it is easier if you raise your hands, unfortunately, or put your little the little hand up so I can see it. Jan. Um, I, th I find this um, A, B, C, and D, they're, they're a little bit too specific in a way because uh, at my age, I think I could safely say I have been one of those at some point in my life or all of them at some point in my life because it would depend on who was teaching me and what I was supposed to be learning um, and for instance if I'm a fairly academic person creativity I find quite difficult or I might be the other way around or I might be trying to learn something practical um, so I don't know. I, I think you can you can tr you can't pigeonhole people in quite the way that this appears to be doing. Um, and I, I've really got an issue with the. Um, I, I'm not sure about the word portion, but um, I don't know. I think it, it it's a bit tough because not everybody can learn quickly, and not everybody can retain information. And we're all born as we are we can't necessarily change that so um, i don't know i have i have some issues with this one i'm afraid more so than i did with the other one you know what i think i think part of what we do with these texts is wrestle with them right we're yisrael we're we're god wrestlers and we're text wrestlers and if it creates challenges all the more so to engage in them and to figure out Sometimes we feel like they don't apply. And sometimes we feel like, am I missing something? I think I would interpret this is a bad portion is this is a this poor person, like this lot in life, even though it says chelek ra in Hebrew. But it's like, you know, I think of the times I've taught lots. I used to teach in, um, I used to be a teacher of 10 to 14 year olds. And my heart always went out to the kid who took so much time to learn something. And then about 10 minutes later, they're like, Miss Mayor, can you please repeat that? I don't remember. You know, and it was just, that's how I relate to D. Like that poor person that just, they're trying so hard and it just goes. And, and but I think you had a really good point about, you know, that at various times, whether it might even not even be throughout life, it could be, even be, um over one class that we find ourselves each of these things at different times um and uh yeah other who else uh i think that's ronnie yeah 
Yeah, um, I think these are intentionally simplistic <laughs> to, to break it down um, and to, to make the point. And I think that it's, it's a little bit of a red herring that grasps quickly because I, I took it to mean um, the effort and application and intention that somebody puts into learning. It's, it's about, you know, somebody who just gives a cursory glance at what they're learning and then forgets about it. You know, they may have had a gain while they were glancing, but it's gone. So it's the gain and the loss are balance each other out. And it's grasping slowly, I think, is is applying yourself with intention. And I think Pete made this this mm -hmm. point as well, that, you know, you put effort into it, you put yourself into it. And that pays, it gives you the benefit of learning that remains with you. Thank and you. one who grasps slowly tries, he, that's a person who tries really hard, but um, I don't know, that, that one troubles me. But I, you know, I, I take your point about the kid who tries really hard and, and then doesn't remember. Um, or adults, actually, it doesn't have to be a child. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not sure about that, but the others I think are are pretty pretty clear um, to me, anyway. The first yeah. one, I'll, I'll call you on. Thank you. I'll call on um, just a second, Pete. Um, the first one reminds me of the student who doesn't study all term and then crams for the yeah. exam, does okay, but then forgets everything. So if you think about, you know, like the next, like I did that a couple of times in university and I remembered nothing after that exam. And when I think about the time invested, the time I lost, the anxiety, the all that. So, you know, I may have done okay, but I lost so much in the process. Although I guess if I did okay, maybe that was really a gain. I don't know, but Pete, last comment and then we'll move on to the next one. It's actually Owen. Um, he, I have to send him the link, so he's copied my name. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, sorry, right, yes. Owen, go ahead. Okay, so let me go ahead. Th these really, really speak to me because I absolutely love the idea of the slow learner and slow to lose because that speaks to me as someone who is deaf and partially sighted who went to mainstream education and sort of been aware of having to really work that extra hard and take a bit longer to grasp things, which I've had to do, but always came out the other end. But the important thing is, I feel my learning has been more solid and just added to my development. It isn't something just superficial to get to an exam or whatever. So I, that's why I really love the bit about a slow learner and slow losing. Thank you. I think that's a nice point to end on for this text. So we'll move on and let me just see where we are on time. Um, yeah, I might, need to, might have a little less for each, but that's okay. So the next one, is about giving. So we've looked at a few things so far. We've looked at temperament, we've looked at learning, and then we're looking at giving. So we have a reader for this one, please. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, John. Four types who give to the decker. One wishes to give, but not that others give. They begrudge what belongs to others. One who wants others to give, but themselves do not want to give. They begrudge what belongs to themselves. Those who want to give and for others to give, they are pious. 
Those who do not want to give and do not want others to give, they are wicked. Thank you. So just um, a quick clarification um, explication on this is that there is an assumption, um, which assumption that giving charity is a mitzvah, which is an obligation that conveys merit. So this is part of where this is coming from, right? That you, you um, by doing a mitzvah, by doing tzedakah, giving tzedakah, you accrue merit or you are, um, earn merit. So uh, who wants to start? <laughs> what is that first one about? Why would Why? someone, oh, go ahead. Who's speaking? Ronnie. Oh, no, no, sorry. I forgot to mute myself. It wasn't me. Okay. <laughs> Who is trying to speak? Uh, I'm trying to see the raised hands. Hold on. Oh, hold on a second. Apologies, people. Uh, Andrea. Andrea. I can see B, C, B, C, and D make sense. But the first one, there are so many reasons might you might not want somebody else to give. If you think they're really struggling and they go and try and give too much, there's plenty of reasons. That's not begrudging them. That's getting really worried for them. It's a different thing altogether. I, I don't like the first one at all. Uh, okay, I can see how you're reading that. I think, I think this is, yeah, yeah, you don't, you, and it actually, Jewishly, you're not supposed to, disadvantage yourself by giving to other people. You're supposed to make sure you're taking care of yourself first. If, I think for this particular text, what they're trying to indicate is, you know, you want to give, but you don't, it, it's about the merit, if that helps. This is about, you want to give and you want to get all the kudos, right? But you don't want others to give. Pete? Owen again. Oh, Owen, sorry. No, it, it wasn't me, actually. I didn't uh, raise my hand. I'm oh, not it's sure what's going Ah, it's probably from the last one. Here we go. I've lowered it. Okay. Andrea, before we, did you want to add to what you were saying or somebody else want to? It just seems like they're trying to be too brash about it. It's, it's just, let's make a nice little saying without stopping and think what we're actually asked. Like. The other three, that's all fine. Mm -hmm. But that first one, it just, there's so many reasons you might not want someone else to give. So you've named one, which is clearly that goes against Jewish teaching to to make yourself worse off by giving, and you wouldn't want someone else to do that. Um, it's really tricky sometimes with these texts because there's a lot that gets implied by the rabbis and what they're saying. They assume certain knowledge. So they there's an assumption built into this that um, the reader will know that that wouldn't be something that somebody would be expected to do anyway, right? So it, therefore, this number one has to be about something slightly different. Owen, have you put your hand back up? No, it's Pete this time. <laughs> 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 um, I think the first one for me is really about that person who looks with envy on the world. So whatever someone else has got, why have they got it and I haven't? And that can be knowledge, it can be money, it could be whatever. It's just that person who goes through life with a, a really dark heart when they look at what other people have got and the grace which they may give it with. That's really powerful. And that's, that is very much linked back to the temperament one, right? Where people start holding grudges and they, and they, don't want good for somebody else. Yeah, thank you. Anything else jump out? Yeah, uh, Linda. Um, I was thinking about point A, 
very much like something like doing a sponsored run. Well, like most of us would go, oh, no, that's a horrendous thing to have to do. Ask other people for money. Oh, it's cringeworthy. It's totally cringeworthy, but it's absolutely necessary for raising lots of money. Um, so that's sort of how I feel about point A. So to, can you just clarify a little bit how that's about one wishes to give, but not that others give? That's that's um, I'm not getting it. Uh, I, for me, that's about you, you're prepared to give your own stuff. That's absolutely fine. But you're not prepared to ask other people to give. Oh, I see. So you'll go and do the run, but you don't want to go asking for donations. Is that how you're saying it? Exactly. Yeah. Got it. OK. Interesting. OK. I hadn't mm. thought of it that way. Um, and sort of resent having to go do that if you have to. Um, I see John with his hand up. Um, I think I read it slightly differently, which is more that somebody wants to give because of the kudos they get from giving, but they don't want other people to give more, which will make their gifts seem less in other people's eyes. Mm. They, they want to be the one that gets all the, the glory and looks good about everything. Um, to the shawl to buy a Torah mantle, and then somebody goes ahead and buys curtains for the ark. And that does me. Then, then I'll think like, well, that's not that's not good because uh, people won't notice my largesse. Yeah, not on. Not only is it like bigger, but it covers. It goes in front of the the, the Torah. It completely covers what they've donated, right? I so it's even worse. <laughs> that every piece of furniture had somebody's name on every single thing, and uh... well, and and it's interesting that bit because um i think that's a question i've heard come up sometimes when i'm we've had um groups visiting it's like why are there names on things and it's because part of that is the hope that people who donate will inspire other people to donate so some of it is because they want to do it in memory and so it's an honor to do it in memory of somebody some of them them might want the kudos right and then it also does other people look and say, wow, they've given that. Well, I could give that. You know, I could give at least whatever. So um, I, I still don't quite believe this, but my mother, who was in a very prim family, she says that the shore they used to go to before somebody did an LAR or maybe just afterwards, they would say how much they donated to the shore. So you buy an LAR. And I guess, and they would say how the, the amount of money, and that seems to be really terrible. So a poor person, presumably, would be almost ashamed when they were doing the LAR because they might have only been able to give, I don't know, a shilling and a rich person who gave five pounds would would seem great. So I suppose it, it would be in that case, somebody who resented somebody else giving more money than them and, and being seen better in the eyes of the congregation. Yeah, and weekdays in a lot of, in the really orthodox shuls, it's called schnoddering, where they bid for the honors, mm -hmm. right? And it's really big in a lot, like on high holy days, like those are the hugest honors, right? So presumably the most wealthy people would bid for those. And going back to what you're saying about the poor person, actually, the the often what is not always the case, but what can be found is that the the less well-off people often come every day during the week and so they're able to get honors like throughout the year and then maybe a couple of people who i'm not saying everybody but those who maybe are better well off and don't come so often so they pay more on you know on yuntu but i'm i'm real personally i'm glad we don't do that in liberal synagogues it's just like it's it's equal you know everybody has an opportunity we are okay so one more comment and then we're going to move on norman just to say uh, um uh, john and yourself have mentioned this but i remember in the shul in which i was brought up schnoddering was done in guineas not even pounds wow. guineas. yeah i don't think i even know what a guinea is but well, that's it's 21 cool. well 21 old chill, old shillings okay I really remember from when I went to the, to the office with my mother for my bar mitzvah, 
my mother said and it's 100 pounds and he said well we don't talk in pounds we talk in guineas <laughs> <laughs> but, but but it's it i i always felt it was distasteful well funnily enough i i really i mean until this moment i didn't i thought my mother was making this up no <laughs> not, not, not like, why is bidding allowed on shabbat yeah. yeah it's not i mean I don't know about the details about sh Shabbat, but I I know more about the weekday. But somebody will, else will have to look that one up and 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 find out the answer. That's a good one for everybody to look up. Okay, um, so we've now done giving, and now we're going to move on to study. And some of this this might look a little strange, but let's just see what happens. So we've looked at a lot of different aspects of refining our character and how we become better people and what is better and what isn't so good and, and learning. And so now we're looking at study. And one of the things I wanted to mention is um, that rabbinic Judaism saw a connection between study and practice. So that's really important for understanding what this means. Um, and that the Torah um, was equal to instruction and behavior. They were linked. Um, that's really important. And the other thing that I wanna mention is this, this has something to do with the importance of attendance. Um, so who would like to read? I have a volunteer. Yeah, go on, I'll, I'll read this. Uh, am I unmuted? Yes, I am. Okay. Unmuted. Four types among those who go to a house of study. A. One who goes but doesn't practice study has the reward for going. B. One who practices at home but doesn't go gets the reward for practice. C. One who goes and practices is pious. D. One who does not go and does not practice is wicked. What do we make of this? <laughs> Why is this given in addition to the earlier mission about learners? What does this add? What does this have to do with anything? So we had this whole thing about learning before. Norman, and then Ronnie. Yeah, is this saying something about the power of, of, of Hevruta, of, of having a study partner or... or... I don't know. It's, so, so, so it's not just about the learning; it's about the participating in someone else's learning, and and the active engagement. Yeah, that learning is not a singular activity. Exactly that. Lovely. Okay, um, Ronnie, I'm I'm wondering if this isn't partly about um, the one who goes but doesn't practice wants to be seen to be going, Ooh. but isn't really interested. Um, so sitting there, zoning out. Yeah, yes, but he's he's there. So, you know, it gets credit. Do you think, do you think he's getting anything out of it? Um, Besides who being- Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> um, probably not. I mean, I think that's what this is, trying to imply that just going is not enough. You have to go and, and do. Right, so he can't just be sitting there passively. Right. Something. Okay, um, Andrea, and then Liz. Um, I was gonna say the first one they looked at about learners, that's about what you are able to do. And how, there's no, whereas this one is about what your intention is. Mm. I mean, the first one was some people are good at students and some aren't. So be it. This one is about, well, now put some effort into it. So it's 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 on the on the yeah, what you do with it, your ability. Yes. Whatever yeah, it's, it's your it's actually make, taking the intention to go and learn rather than, yeah, well, I find it a bit difficult. Some people do, some people don't, but this time, no go and do it and you'll be judged on at least you've made an effort thank you liz and then i'm not sure who is next i called on someone else 
Well, what I was going to say is kind of a sim similar thing, really, that um, the, the one about learning is, is, is kind of, if you're quick to, to forget, it's not something you necessarily have any control over. So those other qualities were, were more like temperament or something about personality, but these ones are all about things you do or don't do. Mm. So the people that are talking about, it's entirely within their control, whereas the other one, not so much. Or at least not without considerable amount of, amount of effort, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Bernard yes. and, and Linda? Um, is it is it that <clears throat> if you don't go to the house of study, means that you, you study at home, you study by yourself? Yes. Well, if you go to the house of study, you exchange to study with others. So there's value. Yeah, there's then there's that it's saying there's obvious then then there's value in studying with others. But it's interesting because it does say they do get the reward for practice. Right, because again, that the um, the study and the practice are linked. So clearly, if they're studying at home, they're also trying to do those things. Mm -hmm. but yeah, they're missing something. They're missing out by not being at home, uh, by being at home. Yeah, Linda. Uh, yeah, it just seems incredibly positive to me. Like there are so many different ways that you can study. You can study in person or at home or whatever, and it doesn't matter. The important thing is just to turn up and do it. Don't you don't you study better if you if you discuss a point with someone else? It depends who you are. Some people don't get involved in discussions. Some people tonight haven't got involved in discussions, but I'm sure they're still absorbing things and taking them in and you know having having important thoughts. I was talking to somebody who is on the autistic spectrum who said that during lockdown, he found it very much easier to study mm. um, because there was no distractions around because he was locked up and he, he could just get on with it. Whereas he, when he went into class, it was much harder to concentrate on what he was doing because of the distractions around him. Mm. So it's interesting because that when we go into, you're, we're actually getting into part of the question I was gonna ask about B, which is how does that apply today because we have streaming, right? We have uh, people can just sit on their phone and learn things and, you know, it's a very different world today. So what, how does that, um, so they don't get the reward, they don't get the reward for, uh, hold on a second, for going, right? So B doesn't actually say that. So they obviously, they don't go. So they don't get the word for going, but they get the reward for practice. And again, reward is merit. Like it's not like they show up and they get candy or a coin or something, right? This well, never mind about merit. The reward for practice is getting better at something. Absolutely. And and getting better and also hearing different perspectives and 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 sometimes solidifying whatever's in your own mind by pushing off against somebody else. There's there's so many, I mean, we have this strong tradition of, of um, Chavruta was mentioned before, where you engage with someone else and you really um, dig into a text or learning. Um, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to stop there. I'm gonna, because I want to just show you the last text and make a glass comment because we're going to have to end. It went really quickly. Um, and I really appreciate everybody's um, contribution. So this one, I think you've all, most of you have probably seen. Ben Bag Bag says, turn it and turn it for all is in it. Look deeply in it, grow old and gray over it and do not stir from it for you shall have no better portion than it. Um, just as an interesting side remark, uh, bag bag they think is was short for Ben Gior, um, Ben Gear and Ben and Bot Gear. So he was uh, the child of two proselytes, two converts, and Ben Hey Hey similarly. But this whole idea that 
that we can take the Torah or take the Mishnah, whatever rabbinic text we're looking at, and it's more than just reading a regular book, right? That we can just dig deeper and deeper. You know, you don't just flip through it once. It's a lifelong process, which that's saying. And, you know, the fundamentals of Jewish learning are studying Torah, growing wisdom, and also is through all that we saw this evening that Jewish texts require work, right? And engagement, um, whether we go and sit at home and start with that or we do it on screen. But um, anyway, thank you everybody for your contributions and uh, your engagement. And most of all, as I said at the bottom of the page, continue to be curious about this text and other texts and uh, thank you. Thanks Rabbi Manik. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was that was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Monique. Bye, Angela. Thank Bye. You. Good to see you. Thank you. Bye, Owen. Thank you, Monique. It's been brilliant. Thank you for all you've done. Thanks, Owen.